heroes are an inspiring group of people. Every one of them, from the larger-than-life comic book heroes you see on the big silver screen to the everyday heroes that let us live the privileged lives we do. Every hero has a story to tell. The doctor saving lives at your local hospital. The war veteran down the street who risked his lives for our freedom. The police officers and firefighters who risk their safety to ensure ours. Every hero is special and every story worth telling. But there is one class of heroes that I think is often ignored. The entrepreneur. The creator. The producer. The ones who look at the problems in this world and think to themselves, you know what? I can fix that. I can help people. And I can make a difference. Then they go out and do exactly that by creating a new product or introducing a new service. Some go on to change the world. Others make a world of difference to their customers. Welcome to The Hero Show. Join us as we pull back the masks of the world's finest heropreneurs and learn the secrets to their powers, their success, and their influence. So you can use those secrets to attract more sales, make more money, and experience more freedom in your business. I'm your host, Richard Matthews, and we are on in three, two, one. Okay, hello, and welcome back to The Hero Show. My name is Richard Matthews, and I am here on the line with Daniel Prince. Daniel, are you there? Yes, Richard. Hello. Awesome. Great to have you here. So... Uh, before we get into it, just make sure people know who you are. You are the author of Kindle one, number um, number one travel book called Choose Life, which is a book about how to escape the nine to five, travel long term with your family during, via the sharing economy, homeschooling and becoming a digital nomads, which should be a super cool conversation. Because for those of you who don't know yet, um, I also travel full time in an RV. Uh, so you guys have done that for a while. And you just before we got on the line, you mentioned you're you're in France now. Um so I guess to start off with, let's let's start off with, who, you know, who you are. Like, what are you known for now? Why would people, you know, look look up Daniel Prince or pick up your books or um, do any of those things? What is it that, that you're known for? Well, uh, quitting the rat race, I suppose, and um, taking uh, taking a slightly different look at life to uh, to explore alternative alternative ways to. To, to look at education because um, we were we were very much stuck in like the day to day uh, you know keeping up with the Joneses very much um, you know stuck in a career that uh, had, you know lasted eighteen years and just having a big awakening and kind of like thinking hang on a minute you know, something something's off and uh, taking a deep dive into that and trying to figure out what it was and what we wanted and where we wanted to go and uh, but, you know, starting the traveling, um, we, we started traveling 2014 and, uh, we, you know, we thought we'd go for like six to nine months and that'd be that and end up back in the UK where we're originally from and um, fall back into a job or get the kids back into a school or something. Uh, but it never worked out that way. We, we just kept going. Um, the, the blog that we started, started gaining a little bit of traction, um, magazines and newspapers and podcasters would would want to know about our story and how we were doing it and why we were doing it and all of this interest just started culminating uh, around especially around um the the homeschooling and the kids uh, because that's a lot of people's fears i think there are a lot of people stuck out there in in this rut or uh, whether it's their are they questioning life around uh, their career or are they questioning life around their work-life balance? Or are they questioning life around like the family is carried on growing and now they've got two, maybe three, or even four kids to support. And they feel as though they're just painting themselves further and further into a corner, into a career they can never leave because they can never have the lifestyle. They, uh, if, they, if they leave the job, they'll never be able to provide for the family. Um, so there is... Uh, it, it, that's the reason I wrote the book to, to try and highlight that um, there is another way. And once we, once we cross that, that line of doubt, um, it's amazing the people that are out there already doing it. Uh, and I just wanted to, to help people understand, give them a, a resource that I wish my wife and I had in our hands when, when we were making the uh, original decision to, to make such a huge life change. Yeah, absolutely. So, I want to talk real quick about sort of like the impetus to make that change. Because I know I was reading your bio earlier. Um, you you read the uh, Four Hour Work Week a number of times, yes. which is a book I've also read. And yep. one of the things Tim talks about in that book is the idea of not saving your life until you've retired, right? Like you're saving right. up to have a life later. Um, yep. It's like why why don't we live life now, right? And and have I think he calls like he's using the term mini retirement. Um, 
and I think what you know what we've ended up doing is probably even better than that because <laughs> um, of our of the lives that we live. But I, I'm I'm interested to see if that is that was one of the impetus for for actually changing your life trajectory, realizing that you know like hey I'm if I continue on this path I'm just going to continue working hard and never really enjoying life until I get to the end, right? Like you've saved up your life until you're old. Exactly. And I think, yeah, look at that. Uh, right next to my bed. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Now, um, how did I get introduced to this book? I, I was, uh, I was at a lunch with, uh, with a friend of mine and um, we were discussing, you know, his, his career was heading one way, mine was heading in a, a different way and uh we, we were both coming we were both riffing about the same thing it's like you know wow he had he had three kids i had uh two and two on the way you know we had twins coming uh well no the, no they've been born they've been born so we had four and it's like oh, this is just this is just crazy like, wow how did how did 18 years pass me by and you know uh, the, the business had changed um we, at the time we were living in Singapore, we'd been in Singapore for 15 years in, uh, with my career, but everything was changing slowly but surely. And uh, I read that book on his advice. He's like, just go and get the four hour work week. You gotta go read that book. And I never read those kind of books ever. And uh, I was very judgmental about people that did read those kind of books, you know, these self-help books. Um, so I didn't think I'd ever pick a book like that up but it's amazing the uh, the power of um, the power of a book if you read it at that that right time. You know, I could have read that I could have read that book five years ago and I'd still be sat in the seat doing the same thing day to day. But because I read it at that point at that juncture, it just opened my eyes to uh, and to your point. Yeah, he calls it the deferred lifestyle, right? That's what he calls it in yeah. his book, the deferred lifestyle, like saving everything up until you become of. Uh, an accepted, an acceptable age, and who's like society, a, a societal acceptable age for you to retire. But like you've now paid your dues, you've paid enough dues, you're 65, you're 70, whatever it is, uh, you can now retire. He's, you know, calling that the deferred lifestyle. And I realized I was living that. Like, oh my gosh, yeah, this is so damn true. And then he talks about um, mini retirements or mini sabbaticals. And, he was so ahead of the times of how work is changing and how you can go remote. Uh, like now, uh, you, you show me LA, you, you, you're doing this from an RV and you travel around the country and you serve your yeah. clients and you can build a business from a laptop. I'm like, man, I want that. Like, you know, how do I do that? Well, I guess, first of all, I've got to buy a laptop and then um, I've got to <laughs> at least uh, quit my job and then we've got to figure out a, a way to do this. Um, so that was the impetus, understanding that there, 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 there could be a different way for me to make a living rather than just going to the same desk every damn day, just grinding it out until it was my time to retire. And then all the kids are gone. And he says in the book, you know, like, what can you do at the age of 65 or 70? Not a great deal. You're not that mobile. You know, you, you're missing the best time of your life right now. And if you can just make a few little changes, and face those fears, those deep down fears that, by the way, are unrecognized. They, they, never, they never come to fruition. Uh, no. <laughs> One of my fears was, well, I'm going to go bankrupt, lose everything, and end up living over a bridge. Um, I'm sure many people think like that. But uh, <laughs> these, there are so many of these fears that just, they don't come true. And, uh, you know, for you, like we were just talking beforehand, you, you already had three kids, and you've had a fourth kid whilst traveling. I bet you never even yeah. had that thought that that would even happen, but there you yeah. go, it, right? I mean, yeah, have a fourth kid while you're traveling, and I know we've um, to, speaking to some of those fears. Like when we first got started doing this whole traveling thing, it was like, you know, um, one of the things that we thought was like, you know, we're going to move into an RV and we're going to travel, um, right? Not everyone does the whole move into RV thing. Sometimes it's Airbnb or other places, or you know, go travel to different places. Um, you know, regardless of how you do it. My thought was just like, we're going to do it for six months. And if we don't like it, we can go back, right? Like there's nothing stopping us from going back and renting another house or, you know, putting, we didn't have our kids in school, but if you had your kids in school, you put them back in school, right? Like the, the, the downside is like you have a six month experiment and you find out that it's not, okay, it's not for me, right? Um, and 
but the upside for us was that maybe it would be a massive positive change in our lives, right? Maybe we would really enjoy being on the road. Maybe we'd, re we'd meet really cool people. Maybe we would have really cool experiences. Maybe our kids would have stories that would just be out of this world compared to what their peers have, right? Um, and like the upside potential for, for it was so massive. And, uh, and just thinking through it and looking back on it, it was, it's way more than we imagined it would be right? Yeah. Um, the, the upside is better than you think. Um, because like looking back on it, we were, um, like you mentioned, we were in a rut, right? We did the same thing every day, you know, every Monday, like I could, I could chart out my week for you and tell you on two o'clock on Tuesday, where we were and what we would be doing. Right. And who we'd be with and what food we'd be eating. Right. And it'd been that way for years. Um, and you know, we have a couple of kids, so it changes up every now and then you add a kid to the family and things change a little bit, but essentially like you pretty much know what your life is like, and there's no, I don't know, there's no spontaneity in it. And, um, when you travel and when you do those things, you're meeting new people and you're experiencing new things and you're eating new things and you're seeing new places. Um, and you have your regular family routines, like, you know, you're, dinner and other things like that. So you, you managed to put some of those routines together for your family and have some of that semblance of regularity. But because of being out of that rut, one of the things I've noticed is my kids have blossomed and opened up. Our family is closer than it's ever been. We have, um, we have experienced a whole bunch of new things, but I've also, my business has grown like 4X since we've gotten on the road. Wow. Um, so, um, and part of that is because you're in a creative mind space all the time. You're not stuck in a rut, like physically um, or emotionally or anything else. You're always sort of like free and creative. Anyways, it's been, it's been really fascinating to see how traveling has impacted my business and um, obviously, you know, your life and your business as well. So anyways, it's really cool. That's amazing. And, and to your point about uh, like being in a creative space and the, the, the difference that makes to your business you know, the difference it makes to your kids' education as well is, is crazy because, you know, well, Sir Ken Robinson, he talks about it on his TED Talk. You know, his question is, do, kill, uh, do schools kill creativity? And undoubtedly they do because you're in this schedule and you're in this rut and you move from one classroom to another, from one subject to another, and you can't get creative in that, in that classroom because... We've got to learn from this textbook and we've got to keep up with the syllabus that's been set by some education minister somewhere that's probably never even been in the teaching profession. Uh, it, that just knocks all of the creativity out of kids. But when you take them out of that school and you put them in an RV and you take and you're in a different place every other day, they're meeting new people, they're having different thoughts, they're hearing different music, they're seeing different countryside, different landscapes, everything's going in. And, uh, you know, that, that feeling that that creative uh, passion is, is is incredible. So I can understand exactly why your business is growing. <laughs> yeah. So what I want to do real quick is sort of transition to a little bit to the business that allowed you to do that. Right. So um, we talk on the show about your origin story. Right. It's uh, it's where you started to realize that maybe you had superpowers and maybe you could help people. I know you mentioned you got into consulting. What did you consult on and how did you sort of discover that? Um, and then, you know, connected back to the travel, how did you realize that you could use that to, um, to help fund your travels? Yeah, great question. Because um, I'm in the middle of uh, another project right now, which, uh, which we'll touch on in a second, which is a perfect tie in. It's uh, amazing timing that we're speaking. Uh, so I figured um, once we left and we started traveling, uh, you know, I'd have some kind of brainwave and figure out some kind of, you know, as uh, Tim Ferriss calls it, figure out a muse and I'd become some kind of amazing drop shipping Amazon associate or something and just make cash that way. Uh, that didn't turn out to be as easy as I thought. And then I just naturally fell into, I think people do, you just naturally fall into one, what you're interested in and one, what you're just naturally good at. And uh, a friend of mine was, um, was starting a, uh, a company in the UK and he just needed help building, um, building out his team. He was, Started getting some traction and getting some investment, and with the investment, he needed to hire people. And you know, like with with many entrepreneurs and many startups, you get that. You know, the CEO has a great idea. 
he goes and pitches it, he gets the funding, and then he can go and grow his service or his product. But the first thing he's got to do is go and hire a sales team. Sure, he's got funding, but not absolutely millions. So he can only afford what he can afford. And that's generally people that are straight out of university that have never picked up a phone in a sales role before. So he turned to me to help um, start mentoring some of these young guys that were coming out of university, 22, like kind of average age. And um, I would just help overcome their fears around like the, the area of sales, you know, the fear of cold calling, the, uh, the fear of objection handling, the fear of uh, pitching and the fear of uh, what else, all of these horrible buzzwords that uh, surround the world of sales, which um, I yeah, find is generally because people used, misunderstand what sales is. Right, completely. And they have, um, so that's the biggest, the first question, I think my next book, Richard, will be called, I Don't Want to Sound Salesy. Because that is 100% the first thing people say on our first call. Uh, when, when I get, on, uh, get online with them and, and try and you know, understand, okay, where are your problems? I don't want to sound salesy. And where does that come from? It comes from what we've grown up with, like this throwback 80s, 90s business mantra of you know, all the films. Look at all the films we've grown up watching. And um, you know this boiler room of uh, sales practices and techniques and growing up in the kitchen and your, your mom or your dad get that call, that hundredth call of that week of someone trying to sell them something with double glazing or a new driveway or whatever, yelling at that person down the phone. So we've grown up seeing all the, the sleazy secondhand car dealer, you know, the, 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 this is all deeply yeah. ingrained. So people, they enter this startup world, but the last thing they want to do is sound salesy. And that like what we need for these people these companies, it's growth. We need every, you know, how many startups fail? We need all of them, if we can, to succeed because we need the business of old to be replaced by the business of new. And we need all of these guys to start succeeding. So my role in helping take away the, um, the fear around sales and taking away um, the fear around connecting with people is um, what I just turned out to be naturally pretty okay at and um just started uh, and you you could do that kind of coaching while you were traveling yeah so th then i realized wow i can just do this on uh on a laptop via skype and you know people can just book calls with me via calendly and uh it doesn't matter where i really am in the world and um, doesn't matter where they are in the world uh, and that's uh that's kind of how um that started um gaining a bit of traction yeah like when I know sales, sales is such a, a hard thing. It was like one of the things that uh, that triggered me for sales and to get good at it was understanding the difference between that that ingrained like hate of sales and realizing that that's not really good sales. Like really good sales is what your doctor does with you when you come in for a checkup, right? And he asks you questions and finds out what the problems are and then connects you with the right solutions. Um, mm -hmm. and when you understand that, that sales is really about helping people solve their problems so they can live a better life, it really helps remove a lot of those negative, like things that go along with, you know, being afraid of sales and not wanting to do it. Um, and like, I've gotten to a point now in my life where I think sales is like, it's, is the highest and best use of people's time. Um, if, if they can, uh, if they can learn to master that skill, um, there's really nothing more powerful than learning how to help connect people to the right solutions. Absolutely. And, you know, I, so I always ask uh, the guys that, uh, that I'm working with is like, you know, you work here for a reason. What is that reason? Oh, the reason is because during the interview process and this and this and this, and I can really see it. It's like, right, okay, so you have the passion. You know you're not selling, like, just some piece of crap that you don't believe in. And, yeah, but I know, but I know, Dan, but I can't, I hate cold calling. Like, right, okay, but... You've never cold called anyone. Like, yes, I do. I, I, I make like 10, 15 calls a day. I'm like, but you're not cold calling. You, you, like, you, you, you've got to redefine this word. Like, if I, let me tell you what cold calling is. You come into my company. I sit you down. I give you a phone book. And I give you something to sell, a carpet tile. And I say, start at A and finish at Z and sell as many of those things as you can until you come back to me and say, right, I need something else to sell. That is... That's cold calling. You're interrupting people's day. You have no idea who they are. You have no reason to even 
why would they ever want a carpet tire? But you've just got to get through 100 calls a day to get through 90 no's, to get to 10 maybe, to get to three. Like It's just, this is business practice of old, and that is old sales, and that's what people connect with when they think of that word sales. I said, so you've not made one cold call, right? And then they're like, huh, no. Because you understand the value of your product, yes? Yes. And you understand the people you need to connect with so you can help grow their business, is that correct? Well, yeah, I, I, I can find them on LinkedIn. So well, then you, you do not reach out to them. You are doing that person a disservice because all they need to know is you've got a solution to a problem that they are probably facing and you can enter into a relationship with them and help them grow. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, uh, um, I actually have a, uh, a short little story about cold calling. I, I, at one point in my business career, hired a sales coach to help me get good at sales. And one of the things he had me do is like, because uh, you know, cold calling is one of those fears. And he's like, what I want to prove to you is that even if you are, cold calling, you know, here's a list of 200 people, A to Z, start at the top and go to the bottom. If you know how to talk, <laughs> um, he used to call it, you know, learn how to give good phone, right? If you know how to give good phone, um, then there's no such thing as a cold call, right? And so he, he list straight up, gave me a list of people, names and phone numbers. And he's like, I don't have anything to sell. Um, he's like, I don't care if you have anything to sell or not, just pick up the phone and call these people. And here's what I want you to do. He's like, pick him up, pick up the phone and be like, hey, I have your name here on a piece of paper. I was supposed to call you. Can you tell me what I was supposed to call you for? And just shut up yes. <laughs> and let him talk. And they would, they would, start, they would start telling you uh, and be like, uh, uh, and you know, they may, may come up with a reason they may not and be like, okay, so well, maybe, you know, well, let me tell you what, what I do, right? Maybe, maybe you were put down in a networking event or something like that. And and so like, here, I do this, that, and the other thing, you know, would you, would someone have recommended you for that? Like, why, why do I have your name on the thing? And like, what, what ends up happening is you find out like 80% of the people will tell you what their deepest, darkest secrets are. <laughs> and then you can help connect, connect them with, yep. the, with the thing. And then, and then you realize that like, it's not really about, um, like cold calling is not as scary as you think it is, A. And B, if you actually have something valuable to offer people, um, then, uh, then it's really useful. So, so that, that's a perfect example, and it's, it's the next thing I kind of go into. It's, you know, once you get people on the phone, um, uh, I, I try and teach, you know, there's just three key things you need to remember. Uh, silence, perfect. You, you, you use in silence, you know, you, you ask the question and you were silent. Uh, and getting good at holding that awkward silence, is that is the, the key to unlocking that person because we, we're, we're, our brains are wired the hate awkward silences and the you know the, the tennis match of a conversation is i speak you speak i speak you speak if you if you pause for like three or four seconds something in me tells me i've not answered that question correctly um they're going to think i'm not, not giving them my time or perhaps i'm not um you know prepping them a little bit did i did i sound correct it was i not eloquent and then you start layering on top and it's behind that silence that you really like to your point and your training that you had. That's when you really start to understand that person where you might be able to help them. So after silence, I always say, right, okay, once that's done, empathy, you have to show empathy to whatever it is that they've been just been describing. Um, show empathy towards that problem and then show authenticity. And authenticity is where you can say, bring out a story of how you're already helping a client in this sector in their business somebody that they've probably even heard of because you're all swimming in the same waters generally and bam you've just created a relationship and the the permission to at least schedule another call yeah so what i what i want to do real quick is is drive drive this home into um you know we we talk a lot about the uh um heroes have superpowers, right? So if you had to say in your business, in your coaching, um, your coaching business, what is the, what would you say your superpower is with helping these people learn sales? Listening. 
listening and how does that, uh, how has that impacted uh, what you were able to, to build with your coaching business? Well, once you listen to like to, to this exact same point, once you listen to them and you let them talk, you understand their fears. And when you understand their fears and their barriers and their blockers, that's where you can help them. Uh, you know, so if you're, um, you can't wave a magic wand over someone, like if you're in a group setting, <laughs> so if you're in a group setting and right, right, okay, I'm going to do a training workshop on cold calling today. And you know, uh, who's, who's got a fear of cold calling in here? No hand's going to go off, right? No one because they don't want to look weak in front of you. And they don't want to look weak in front of their manager. And they don't want to look weak in front of their, their peers. So by getting one-on-one -on -one like this and, and asking a few questions and then listening to their responses carefully and closely and giving them the silence to open up, that would be, that would be the best thing I would say that, um, that I do. And then, uh, th then working on those specific fears and turning those specific fears on their heads. So I, I want to take this another direction too, since we, you have, we have this interesting connection in the travel Yes. Would you say you developed any new superpowers in, you know, either new ventures or business and things that you learned while you were traveling that have either helped you grow that consulting practice or any new projects you're working on? Yeah, uh, a restored faith in humanity. Explain that. When I left my career, I'd, I'd been 18 years in pretty much the same area of business. And you build up barriers around everyone else who isn't in your in your business right they, they they don't matter they're not in my network it doesn't you just you walk past people on the train every day you might see them every day but you never say hello to them you might walk past the secretary every day and never say hello to her you might uh, you just disregard people because they're you know they're not important to you because you're so busy and you know you have the media layering on top of all of that and with, with negative news and fake news and whatever else to make this world feel like a, a really unsafe place and all of these bad stories that are coming out of all these different countries and you know you just become this like insular secular person and i've got my friends and that's all i need and i've got my family and blah 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 now when we started traveling um we did that via the sharing economy and that's how we kind of like managed to go for so long because we weren't exchanging money for accommodation. We were exchanging people's homes or we were volunteering what, uh, our services to work for in, in exchange for accommodation. And it's only then that you realize, wow, like people are just crazy nice and people are willing to, to, to jump through so to help each other. And, you know, complete total strangers. I'm sure you guys, you turn up a, uh, I'm sure you like an RV park or something, or you, you could be just camping out in the middle of a, like, um, a, a huge national park or something. But if you meet another person just out there, you could be talking for hours. And if there's any way that they can help you, they would. So it was, um, that was a big realization for me that, um, that coming out of that, environment into this scary world of um you know what's next what country we're going to be in next you know what um we're not we don't have a roof over our heads in a week's time what are we going to do we've got four kids and then all of a sudden it just starts coming together and coming together and coming together people are just wired to help each other yeah i i can i can definitely second that sentiment because like i know when we were at home right in a we call it sticks and bricks house right when we we're in a sticks and bricks um i think we knew one of our neighbors in the whole neighborhood right like and we lived next to them for three years right we knew one of them <laughs> and like we said hi to them over the fence they're the ones that live right next to us and like that's all we ever did we never like had dinner together or not, nothing like it's just we said hi when we saw each other um and like we lived in the neighborhood for three years and we've been on the road for two years now and every place you go you realize you're not going to be there forever right mm -hmm. so if you're going to meet people you got to actually like try Mm -hmm. right and everyone else is the same way so you're able to to meet people and build friendships and i know like a couple of months ago we um we were in an rv park in texas and um someone pulled in next to us they had a couple of kids that were our kids age and like we just you know got up went over and said hi like as soon as they pulled in and introduced ourselves and invited them over for dinner and right. you know it like because that's just that's the way life goes like they might not be here tomorrow right so if you're gonna say hi and have dinner with someone you got to do it now 
um, and um, which I think is one of the the things that that uh, that you know really helps with the traveling is that like you have to live for now, right? You can't live for tomorrow because you know everything in your life could be different tomorrow. Like you could be in a new place, the people that are around you could be could leave, you could leave. Like it's it's like you have today, um, and so you have to sort of seize that. And I remember it was really funny because that particular story. That couple, it was their first day in their RV, their first day of traveling, right? And so they pulled into the park next to us, you know, happenstance. And the first thing that happens is like they pulled in, they park their RV, and they get invited over for dinner. And they're like, <sighs> we've lived in our house for 20 years, and never have we had one of our neighbors invite us over for dinner. Like, uh, <laughs> like obviously, there's something different going on. They're really good friends now. We've been close friends for a good six months and have traveled together and been also over the place um and done done stuff together um but yeah like the the uh, the faith in humanity is just um that's just one of hundreds of stories over the past couple of years of meeting people and like like you know we broke down on the side of the road in somewhere and like i had i was working on a uh, um working on a fuel pump and trying to fix a fuel pump and i had someone stop off on the side of the road it's like hey let me help you with that i got a whole box full of tools and you know i didn't even get his name Right. And he stopped, helped me fix the fuel pump and get it all ready to go. Got back on the road, said our goodbyes and moved on our on our day. Like that's that's the world we live in. Like the world that you hear on the news and the TV and everything is not it's not our world. Mm -hmm. Like the people, mm -hmm. the people that are all around you are they're just like you. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, just like you and me, like we have our families, we have our lives and we, you know, we want to have connection and, you know, have good relationships with people. And it's been a very striking positive difference to see to like actually see the world see how good it is yeah the, the number one takeaway for us without a doubt <laughs> awesome so um i go back to our our discussion of of heroes and superpowers and whatnot the the opposite of your superpower would be your kryptonite right your fatal flaw if you had if you could nail down one thing that either really stopped you um, or you know, held you back when you were building your consulting business, what would that be? And then what did you do to help sort of rectify that so you could overcome it and continue to uh, continue to grow? I think it's like with anybody that's starting out um, with anything, you know, you could be walking into a conventional job and you, you know, you, you've been through the interview process and you've been hired or you're starting a business or you're uh, you know you, you're talking about starting a family it's self-doubt self-doubt and th this inner critic is uh is my kryptonite and uh it's taken a long time to try and uh understand you know it's not just me that has self-doubt it's not just one of us it's it's everybody and it's it's held us all back from from so much in life um you know, we were talking before we come on here and, you know, how long were you thinking about taking a trip before, before that, uh, before you actually like did? Like 10 years. Right. Yeah. And so that was 10 years of you talking yourself out of it, no one else. And that's, that, that's holding so many people back. And then um, layer on top of that social construct that surrounds us, you know, you, you've got the self doubt and they're already telling you how many business ideas have you talked yourself out of, right? You know, just you, more you than I can count. Right. right. Could, have, we, could have launched the, who knows the next, the next best company in the world, but we talk ourselves out of it because, well, that's not the thing we should do. We should just keep your head down. We should just do this. You just follow life and da, 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 because that's what's getting drilled into us. Um, so coming up, overcoming self doubt is uh, is really 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 difficult. Yeah, and like I you know I don't have enough money to travel. It's going to cost too much money to travel. The technology doesn't exist for me to be able to do what I want to do on the road. Like how are we going to take care of our kids in school, right? Like every, you know how are we going to have internet on the road? Like all every single one of those is things that like stops you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like if it really comes down to it, it's a fear of the unknown, right? Like I don't I don't know the answer to that, so it scares me enough to keep me from trying. Yeah, and that, that actually is a great uh, exercise in the four-hour work week, which I did um, when we were making this decision, the, the fear-setting exercise. I don't know if you ever uh, did that. Instead of goal-setting, fear-setting. I probably did. Right, and um, Tim gave a talk about it as well, a TED Talk. Damn, I watched a lot of TED Talks. 
um, <laughs> he was uh, <laughs> where he talked about fear setting. And uh, yeah, you know, it's all great. And, you know, foofy foo goal setting. I'm going to be here and I'm going to be here and I'm going to be here. And, you know, this, you've got to have, uh, put this into here, get the flywheel turning and all of this, you know, nice entrepreneurial jargon stuff. But then it's like, right, no, set your fears. Okay. What does that mean? It's like, well, you know, what is the worst thing that can happen? What is the absolute groundbreakingly worst thing that can happen? And, you know, and then reverse engineer that. So, okay, so if that did happen, what would you have to put in place to, to get yourself back on back on track? Because there's probably a hundred things you could do. Um, so for me, the example is, you know, as I said before, going bankrupt and having to live under a bridge, being homeless, like com total fear. Like, how irrational is that? Okay, if you if you if you if you're, you're going to go start traveling on some savings, then you know that's there. You're not just going to completely throw it all away. Um, you know, what would it really have to happen to go completely bankrupt? Probably another financial crisis. And if that did happen, you'd go bankrupt if you were employed or not. And what would what would then you put in place to 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 fix that? Well, you wouldn't go and live on a bridge because between my wife and I, we have plenty of brothers and we have mums and dads Family, and yeah. houses, right? <laughs> so yeah, you, know, you go and knock on the door and like, hey, can we check up with you guys? And then you start reaching out to people, and then you can get back into a, a network. And you know, it's like, wow, that was yeah. Yeah, and you you realize things like, like you're you have skills, right? You you've developed a set of skills, and mm -hmm. even if everything goes away, your skills don't, right? Mm -hmm. Like that is not like you you know going to wake up tomorrow and suddenly you know like I do marketing and write copywriting and stuff. Like I'm not you know. Even if we, in my case, we blew up the RV and I lost all my clients because of, you know, something major in the industry shifted and whatnot. And I have like no income and no house. Like my, my mom, hundred percent guaranteed. She would be like, come home. Like you can <laughs> check up in this, in the, in the bedroom, we'll put the kids on the couch. You can figure it out. Right. Like, and that's just like, just my mom, not counting like my grandparents and my wife's parents and everyone like they would people in our family would fight over who we could come and st <laughs> who we could come and stay with and i get out tomorrow and there are people who could use the skills and stuff that i've developed so like i like mm -hmm. even the worst case scenario you still live through mm -hmm. right like <laughs> might be tough might learn some things but it's not as scary as you think it's going to be no for sure so so your driving force, right? Spider-Man fights to save New York. Batman fights to save Gotham. Google fights to index all the world's information. What is it that you <laughs> get into today that you fight for now, right? That you actually are, what's driving your your goals and your future and everything in your business now? Hmm, good question. Um, I wanna change. I wanna change the, uh, the thought process and the practice around sales for, for young people entering the workforce. Uh, I don't want them coming in to, um, especially legacy businesses. It's not the same so much in startups, you know, you, you come in, you're given the responsibility straight away. Uh, I, I, I really despise this narrative around millennials are lazy and uh, an entitled generation. That's just nonsense, complete nonsense. Um, what, what, what you're having is um, young people fighting over themselves to get into um whether it's like the insurance business or the banking business or you know finance sector these legacy businesses that we've all been sold on like these are the jobs these are the ones that pay these are the ones you've got to compete for and you turn up there and you've done all everything to jump through all the hoops and first your first task is go and get me a sandwich and a cup of coffee that's why you have a disinterested workforce because they don't no, they, they want us to get there and add value. That's why we're seeing this huge shift and these huge drives to startups. But we've got to be careful about um, the the way that sales is conducted and make sure that um, there's Seth Godin calls it a connection economy, and we need to we need to move to that rather than interrupting people. We need to start connecting with people and building relationships that are going to last careers and businesses a lifetime. And um, it's funny, you said earlier, um, marketing and, and copywriting, and um, that we can, why is it in a company that uh, people can hide behind these, these words like marketing? Oh, they're on the marketing team. 
They're on the customer experience team. They're on the advertising team. Uh, oh yeah, who are those guys? Oh, they're the sales team. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Well, just uh, what about the tech guys? Oh, they're the tech guys. Well, he's the CEO. He's the CFO. What I want people to understand is every single person in that company is in sales, in sales. But there's only one team that has to wear that label, and that label comes with this deep-rooted fear that we have around sales, which is unfounded, and it shouldn't be. Um, and that's why we need to change the narrative around it. But if you're in marketing, you're in sales. If you're a copywriter, you're in sales. Yeah. If you're in tech, my God, you are the cutting edge of sales because you're building a website that's got to catch my attention in three seconds flat. Otherwise, I am gone. So if we can get everybody on a level playing field and say, right, guys, we are all here to reach the same thing. The CEO, he is in sales. He's got to go and get funding. He's, tr he's trying to raise $2 million. The guy's in sales, right? So this yeah. is what I want people to understand and break down these um, break down these rules around uh, like this this dread around sales. And I think um, that this negative narrative around it. I can't remember the, your original question now. I just got on a bit of a rant. Yeah, there. so it's just your your driving your driving force, and that's oh, it's yeah, absolutely I guess that's true, true, right? Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, that leads is to is that. that and there's another driving force which uh, is being stoked right now. Uh, uh, we're part of, uh, I'm part of a team that's um, putting together a, uh, a homeschooling summit. And it's going to be a free online summit where we are interviewing probably 30 to 40. I think we'll get about 40 people who have, either they've done exactly like you. So um, perhaps, we, perhaps you can come on and be a guest, Richard. We'll, uh, we'd yeah, like to perhaps. hear you. So, uh, and we, we've got filmmakers of um, documentaries. Uh, we've got families that have traveled for like 10 plus years. We've got families that, have, like yourself, you, their kids have never gone to school and they've already left school and they're already succeeding. I mean, define success, another bug there. Um, but, uh, you know, they're okay, right? They're not dumb. They, they, they can socialize with, uh, with other people. And I'm sure uh, you might come up against that. <laughs> parent you're laughing at the socializing question or accusation <laughs> <laughs> all the time people are like how do you socialize your kids and i was like have you been to a school because like they, oh, they, they 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 get socialized in terrible ways right and like out outside of primary education is there ever another time in your life where you were stuck with a homogenous group of people right here is 35 seventh graders and they're all going to be stuck in a room with one adult and like that is a social experiment that only happens in the public school education sphere like that's not the way socialization happens anywhere else in the world it's not gonna happen in the job place it doesn't happen in your neighborhood it doesn't happen at church it doesn't happen anywhere except school right so the skills that you learn for socialization are like they're not even applicable outside of school. So like, what, what the hell are you talking about? Anyways, that's I, my rant for the day. Oh man, <laughs> well, I, there's a whole chapter about that. There's my rant, exactly. You could have written a chapter about my rant there. And um, <laughs> there's nothing social about school. It's antisocial. It's completely antisocial. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you're like, here's this test. And this test says you have to do it on your own. You're not even allowed to talk to people around you. So like, that's also not the way that you deal with problems in the workforce, whether you're running no. a business or you're on a team somewhere, you're pretty much always conquering problems with a team, right? Mm -hmm. And the th skills like delegation and using people for their strengths and all those things, things that you know, they never even talk about in a school that are all part of socialization that never, it's not even a thing. So anyways. No. <laughs> That's okay. a, how do we get we can rant all day about old school oh god yeah <laughs> you, you, you you're just touching the surface <laughs> and so we we're talking about driving force so the homeschooling home summit and and yeah yeah and, and um but you know everybody i'm talking to at the moment i'm uh, conducting some some of these interviews for the summit and uh, we get onto this this would be a perfect riff about um social socialization and uh god uh, you know what, what what we hope what we hope from this summit and the driving force behind this summit is one, we know there are millions of people out there that you know are questioning their current lifestyle and or 
and questioning the the social construct and don't know where to look for the validation of uh, their questions um, and that's what we're trying to do uh, with this summit so it's um we put all together now it's going to run from mid-june to the end of to the end of june uh, completely free uh online summit for people to go and um get all of these uh these great speakers and, and sharing their experiences. And, and here's another thing, which I'm sure you've, uh, you've come up against this, uh, you know, people that denounce homeschooling or world schooling um, are pro generally people that have never done it. And they're just speaking from their cookie cutter lifestyle of this is the system. This is what we need to be in. You know, it's all planned out for them. And you tell them, right, yeah, well, I'm going to take my kids out of school. I'm going to go, well, no, you can't do that. Well, why not? Because, you know, it's going to damage their, they'll never be able to um, like perform in like natural society. They're never going to be able to get a job. And you're like, wow, okay. You're giving advice about something you've never done. <laughs> and it's, yeah. It, it, what, when, what I find, what I find interesting about that is that we, we do run into that. People are like, like, you know, your, your kids aren't going to have the education that you want them to have. Like it's, the, so you, you get like both sides. Some people are like, oh man, they're gonna have a great education because of homeschooling and other things. But then you have the other people that are like, you know, staunchly opposed to it. And that lasts until they meet your children. Yes. <laughs> right? And it's yep. like, just spend an hour talking to my son, right? My, my nine-year-old son who talks like he's graduated high school and has, has his whole like first couple of business plans written out and is working on product development like on the side when he's not doing things, right? And, you know, has discussions, like he can hold a conversation with an adult better than most adults can because yes. he's got life experience and language and vocabulary and, you know, just life thoughts that aren't available to other kids his age. Um, Right. And I don't know, it, like the, the moment you, you get a chance to spend a time with, a, you know, a bunch of kids who've been homeschooled well, um, it's strikingly different than kids who've been educated in the public school system. It's so true. It's so true. We've had the same experience time and time again. And, um, you know, not, not only with our kids meeting adults and adults like commenting to us after it's like, wow, you know, but also when like any homeschool kid I've met or world school kid I've met, just the, they look you in the eye. Just that, just that alone. Yeah. They don't have that, that fear of authority, like, oh no, adults in the room, uh, you know, heads down, you know, let's open our books, pretend to be doing something. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, they find the words. They look you in the eye, they're engaged. They're, they look you in the eye, they're engaged, they're excited. They want to know your story. They want to be connected with you, right? Like, because we, we meet homeschooling kids all over the place. Generally, they're well-behaved. Right, they're they're part of something bigger, and they they know it, right? And it's 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 powerful. And what's interesting is it's it's not necessarily that they're not going to get to the same place, right? It's just going to take my kids less time to get there, right? Mm -hmm. Because they have they have more they have more available to them, um, and you know it's we we have the opportunity to give them advantages we didn't have. Yes. Why not give it to them? Yeah, exactly, and. Um... They're not all weird and they're not all like um, kept in a basement and it's not it's not like some religious cult or something with you know all of these <laughs> stereotypes and myths that, that you know surround the subject and have kept it downtrodden for so long we, we hope you know we have a driving force between that there's a team of like four or five of us putting this together and we hope like you know this thing could just smash this wide open yeah so after the driving force, we talk a little bit about hero's tool belt, right? Maybe you have a big magical hammer like Thor or a bulletproof vest like your neighborhood police officer, um, or maybe you just really love Evernote or Zoom or Google Drive or something like that. What are some of the tools that you use to help affect your your business, whether that's the consulting business that you, you run or this new homeschooling venture you guys are starting? Technology, like the laptop is just, my God, I mean, where was and what it's going to do to to shape uh, the future of work we don't even like, the internet how old is the internet now let's say we've had the internet for like 20 years barely we are we are this far into the story 
of what is what this is going to unlock and um having the you know the the, the internet the wi-fi the connection like this like we were talking before like here we are we're on zoom six months ago we would have been on skype but yeah this you know so zoom is becoming like a huge thing and it's um and, that's and just good. just so people are aware you're you're in like the south of france and i'm in southwest america right like, not, not only that you're in southwest america thousands. sitting in an rv which uh you know yeah what do you have like a satellite dial up or something what's what's the what's the setup um no i've I've got a uh, um, a router that's hooked up to a couple of mobile hotspots. So I've got Sprint, and Verizon, and T-Mobile all hooked up to it, and it intelligently picks which one has the best service, and it hooks up to up to that thing. Um, and I've got a little signal booster on the roof that you know boosts that signal for when we're farther away from from civilization, um, and it lets us pretty much like ninety percent of the time we have great internet connection and can do whatever we want to do. Occasionally, I, I have to drive into town to a Starbucks. Right. Or, or or find a co-shared working space, which is uh, cropping up yeah. everywhere. Um, you know, so but that's like that's the amount. Is it? We've been traveling for two years. I've had to drive into town for internet maybe four times. <laughs> that's a superpower. That's something yeah. we couldn't have even imagined twenty-five years ago. Yeah, and like it was just mind-boggling. And it's you know, uh, and more and more people will will wake up and. Um, figure out that they don't have to be locked away in an office in a nine to five forever. Um, you know, the, the, the future of work is freelance. The future of work is project work. Um, you know, if you, if you, yeah. if I look 10 to 15 years out, uh, which is, you know, when my kids are going to be entering the workforce and I want them to understand like the chance of you guys having an office job is almost zero. Uh, so yeah, get used to, get used to, I mean, it's a tough one, right? How do you, Find balance that exposure to technology with your kids when all they want to do is sit there and look at the uh, look at the screen and play some games and stuff. But you have to expose them to so, it because this is their future. So what's what's interesting is is like when we're done with the work day today, like we're gonna go into open Arizona and go feed some donkeys and then probably go down to the Colorado River and go kayaking, right? Wow. So like my son right now is in the other part of the RV on an iPad doing his school curriculum. Right. Mm -hmm. So he's got all morning with his school curriculum playing with technology. And then the other half of our day is out experiencing the world. Right. And that mm -hmm. happens almost every day. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy to have that balance when you're homeschooling and stuff like that. At least if you're, if you're doing stuff, but bringing them back, that whole idea, like we're not in a rut. Like we're always in new places doing new things next that later this week, we're going to be down at the London bridge. Right. Um, you know, the one that they moved from your country over to our country like 40 years ago. <laughs> and, uh, so anyways, Most we get to get to Australian, so it's nice to know. <laughs> yeah, well, we, I've been there before. So we actually have, we've gone through the museum and everything and got to see like how they actually moved the bridge brick by brick from London to America, uh, which uh -huh. is crazy. But yeah, but the, to, to that point. Exposing you to, te to technology, one of the, the things that my son, a couple of years ago, um, I've been working really hard. I want, I, like, trying to get the kid to want to learn to type, right? Like, learn to type on the computer. And, like, we've found some cool things, typing tutor and a few other things. That he, that he is learning to type. But the initial discussion um, was hard because he was like, I don't need to learn to type. Mm. It's like, anytime I need to do anything, I just push the little microphone and talk to it, and it types for me. Exactly. Right. And, and, and so like he asks it questions, he writes his things out, he puts notes together, like, and I've even trained him now he's doing writing assignments for, um, for school. And I'm, I've been teaching him one of the ways that we do writing is like, we'll actually speak our thoughts into a voice memo thing and have it transcribed and then edit the transcriptions. So I've been teaching him that process as well. But like, specifically, I'm like, your kids may not need to know how to type, but you are no. at least probably the last generation that you're going to have to learn how to type because you're st we're still in this transitionary period, right? 20 years from now, that probably won't happen. Like I've seen some of the stuff they're talking about um, being able to use the, uh, the, the voice recognition and mm -hmm. um, what do they call it? Sub vocal speaking, right? Like when you read to yourself in your head, you actually activate your um, the nervous system all the way up into your throat um, mm -hmm. and the electrical signals that turn into speech it's only it's only a, a very brief difference, but from the electrical signal to the actual speech recognition. So you can rewrite the 
speech recognition to pick up those electrical signals and you can communicate with a computer subvocally. Um, and like they're testing these things now, right? So I would imagine that in the next 15 years, like the, our in out, the IO for computers is gonna drastically change. But the reality mm -hmm. is, is like, I know with my kid, I was like, you still need to learn how to type. <laughs> like, <laughs> we're not at the point yet where you could just not learn how to type. So <laughs> yeah, so we have, to, we have to force some of the technology on him. But what's interesting is like his default for technology is something that like we've had to get to over the course of 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. and, like, that's, that's where they're starting from. Like they're, you know, the whole idea of standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Imagine what our kids generation does to technology just because they didn't have to learn it. It was something that they breathed from their, from birth on. You're, you're so right. And when you, you look back like 30 years, you know, yeah, of course, like the, the advance of technology since we've been alive has, has been, you know, crazy, but yeah, now they're being born into this and it's already here. What they can layer on top of it when when they come of age to start playing around and learn this whole AI thing. Um, and to use an analogy I use with my kids, um, that typing one's great. I've never heard that one. I'm going to start using that. But I say to my kids, you could possibly be the last generation. So my 13 year old, you could possibly be yeah, the last generation that needs to learn how to drive a car. Um, after that, it's gone. Yeah. There's going to be no need. Um, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy, and you know that. Where does that lead us to the future of education? Uh, because it's already far behind what we have today. No, so if it doesn't change in the next 10 years and um this is a like a, a layer on top of the, the homeschooling summit that we're that we're putting together behind that is going to be something called galileo which is going to be and when i was talking about all work is going to go freelance we see that in the teaching and education professions as well I mean, we've got all of these teachers don't forget many of these teachers are stuck in the system as well they're there in a system and they see that it's a system and they're, they're being um, told what to teach and in a certain way and they can't get themselves across and they, you know, they're, they're probably not enjoying school as much as the kids aren't enjoying school. Um, so if we can take teaching online where we have a place where like your kids, for example, if, if your kid wants to learn about um, typing, maybe there's a typist teacher he can connect with once or twice a week for 30, 40 bucks or something to learn typing in the manner that he wants to learn it. Um, but then yeah. we could have like this, this online platform where we're connecting teachers with passions, but specific niche passions to students that want to really connect with that specific niche. Yeah, passion. you can what connect, with, connect with experts. Right? Sure. Like the curriculum, my, the school curriculum my son is going through right now, he's in the fourth grade. And one of the things that I've been really blown away by is um, because of our choice in the school, we have the ability to put him like, um, you know, a, if he was in fourth grade in public school, he would have the, the history teacher that was assigned, you know, that lives in that area and is assigned to the fourth grade history teaching, right? My son's history teacher is one of the like preeminent historians for world history in the country, right? Like, like he's he's an expert's expert in the space. Wow! And like that that's the kind of thing that you can do when you're homeschooling. Like same kind of thing. Like the the guy who is teaching my son science um, on his science curriculum is an entomologist, right? And they study entomology in the fourth grade, right? Mm -hmm. And he's not just he's not just a science teacher. He's like legitimately a PhD in entomology, and is putting together. Um, well, I guess he does a couple of things. It's entomology and a few other things. But either way, like you can connect your students with people who are at the top of their field and mm -hmm. learn from those people, um, which is yeah. just not something that you have available to you. Right. And, and that's not to say that your, your teachers who are at the local schools aren't any good. They're probably fantastic, but there's something to be said for someone who is at the top of their field teaching your kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, who's to say that, that, that PhD doctor and whatever has reached age 55 or 60 and is forced to retire because, but now what? He still has so much to give. 
um, coming onto platforms now mm -hmm. where, where technology allows them to connect with people all over the world, they can carry on. The teachers are born teachers. They don't do it for money, but he can still, or she can still um, sustain a lifestyle and at the same time feed their passion uh, for teaching and mentoring. Uh, and I think that's where the, the yeah. future of education needs to go and will go. Yeah, um, it's totally going to change everything that's uh, that's happening. I think the we live in one of the most exciting times ever, um, which I know I think every generation thinks that, but um, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it might well, actually true, be though. true. Yeah. Oh. yeah, so we live in live in some really cool times. So, are you tired of trying to write webinars that don't consistently convert? How would you like to have a webinar that effortlessly created sales in your online business? You can. Introducing the Webinar Alchemy Workshop. Webinar Alchemy Workshop is an online masterclass that will help you write incredibly persuasive webinars for your online courses quickly and easily. Using what you learn in this class, you can build a webinar that educates your entire audience while still creating sales. For a limited time, you can purchase this masterclass for only $7, and you'll get the exact framework I've personally used to help my clients sell more than a million dollars worth of online coaching and training just over the last year. Simply text the word ALCHEMY, A-L-C-H-E-M-Y, to 444-999, and I'll send you all the details. The music is by Purple Planet Music. Visit www.purple-planet.com. So let me uh, let me move on a little bit. Last a couple of questions here in the interview is your own personal heroes, right? Frodo had Gandalf, Luke had Obi-Wan, Robert Kiyosaki had his rich dad. Who are some of your heroes, right? Were they real life mentors? Were they speakers or authors? Were they peers who were just a few years ahead of you? And how important were they to what you accomplished in your sales training business or in the uh, homeschooling business that you guys are getting started? Yeah. I already held his book up, Tim Ferriss. I mean, that was the that was the unlocker. If it wasn't for that book, I could still be sat in that in that same seat. So uh, big up Tim. Um, since um, since then, I've started reading up more and learning about more people in that circle. And um, his his podcast introduces you to some amazing people. Uh, Seth Godin is another one. I think Seth Godin. Um, Wow, I mean that guy is just incredible. Like his insights into education as well, um, his insights into sales and, and marketing, and, and you know he's he's one of the changing forces and driving forces behind that. Um, so I I picked those two out um, for sure. Yeah. Cool. And last question I always ask is uh, is basically your guiding principles. What are top one or two principles or actions that you apply every single day in your business that have sort of contributed to the success that you have, you enjoy? And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe which ones you wish you had when you started. It's funny. I, I, I reassessed this in December and it's connect, 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 connect. Spend um, 30 to 45 minutes a day connecting. Uh, and whether, uh, and I found um, LinkedIn to be uh, a really um, incredible tool late that um, I think is flying under the radar. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk is speaking about that at the moment as well. He, he's seen um, like uh, a lot of, of traction there. And uh, it's something that I think is critical to connecting with people that, um, that are speaking your language uh, that, that you can help and add value to. And it's easy to find them. Uh, they're, they're on LinkedIn. You can do a hashtag search. This year, I thought, well, you know, what do I want to do? Uh, I want to help. If I want to help companies, if I want to help startups, what kind of startups do I want to help? And, you know, where can I make a difference? And what would be the best difference? And, you know, for me, it'd be um, helping climate or social impact change uh, startups. So I just started hashtagging climate change or um, social impact and um, who's writing articles. And, and man, there's so many people out there, like there are CEOs writing articles uh, specifically about their um, their area of, uh, of business and what they're trying to do and what they're trying to achieve. And all you got to do is like it, comment underneath it and share it. And then we'll get in contact with you and you can open up some really high level um, conversations. So that's what I've been doing. Just connect. That's a, that's a great, a great idea too. And like, it's, um, we talked about this a couple of times on, on this show in the past with a few other interviewees that, uh, that networking is undervalued, I think, 
right? Where yeah. people people don't really understand what it is. They don't they don't really what's, get. What's they think the that picture? Is what's like, the picture in their head of networking? Yeah, it's like this negative negative thing that like I'm going out and I'm you know I'm I'm handing my business card out and hoping that people mm -hmm. are going to call me back. Yep. Right, and realizing the difference is like in finding finding people who have a problem you can help solve, mm -hmm. right? And and um, in realizing that sometimes when you're networking, you're just you're just giving for the sake of giving, um, and that comes back in the future, right? And like I've um, you know interviews like this, like between you and I, will probably turn into something in the future, regardless. You know who knows what, right? 100%. And yeah, and and like, but that's not something you go into it thinking I'm going to go and do this interview so I can get something out of it, um, right? And um, I don't know that that some of the coolest things that have happened in my business in my life have been a, as a result of connecting with good people. Mm -hmm. It's so true, and I don't understand why this this word networking is such a dirty word. It's a dirty word like sales. It's um... <sighs> And again, it comes back to using this tool, this tool that we have. We all have this 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 ability to connect with these people via this uh, this medium of the internet. Uh, you know, if, if you'd have given a, a sales guy in 1982, like you know, the, the the ability to connect with anybody in the world in their specific business, where would we be today? No, they're hammering phones like knuckle draggers but uh yeah there you go connect that that's um that's what i've been doing so um, that's the message yeah that's awesome <laughs> so i've got a okay, closing so... question i got a closing question for you sure now you, you you obviously have a love of travel and uh you can see um uh into the future where things are going uh if you um yeah let, let, let's ask you this are you uh are you ever going to visit mars Mars? Yeah. Oh, uh, let's see. I I have seen the SpaceX stuff um, and a few other things talking about them putting hotels in space and then like putting a, a colony on the moon and stuff like that and potentially getting a colony on the Mars. Um, I have, thinking about that, I, I think we are probably closer to having a hotel that is, is uh, um, you know, orbiting space than any of the other two. If we get to a point where we have a colony on Mars before I'm too old to do it, absolutely. But I, I think um, just just looking at where technology is now, I think probably one of our next steps is the um, the space based travel where you take off in New York and you land in London and they go straight up into the atmosphere and drop back down and it's an hour and a half flight instead of an 18 hour flight. Mm -hmm. um, that'll probably end up being one of our first, you know, like a consumer trip to space. Um, and probably beyond that, it's like one of the hotels or something like that. I could see that happening in my, my, my lifetime. Um, I could be totally wrong on that timeline because I don't really know much about that space, but I have thought about it before. And I'm thinking those are the couple of things that will happen first. And I would absolutely want to be in a position financially to be able to afford those experiences before, I, before they get here, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm growing the business that I'm growing, right? Because it's allowing me the the, the freedom to live the life I have now and I'll actually build the financial resources to not have those limited choices in the future. Cool. Cool answer. How about you? Will you, uh, will you, will you go to Mars? Conflicted on it. Conflicted. Uh, it's like a four-year journey, you know? So they'd have to cut that down. <laughs> um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Most people say, uh, most people say no. And then the, uh, the follow-up question is, okay, would you, would you visit your grandkids on Mars? Because this, it's weird to think that this is going to be an option on our table as humanity. Uh, it's, um, it's just like, wow, it's like huge. Have, have you ever read, um, what do you call it, the Horses of Scott Card's Ender's Game series? No. So... Um, Ender's Game is um, the best-selling sci-fi novel pretty much every year since 1978, um, and it sells out of print every year. Um, it's ridiculously good. Um, but the, the the books following the, that, they've got a trilogy of books, um, and one of the things that they have um, is they have something that's called the Ansible, right? And the Ansible um, is... It's based on, you know, pretty pretty regularly in science fiction, they talk about zero space or some concept therein, right? Z space, zero space, negative space, dark matter, 
they're all sort of in that same vein of like, there's something that we can pop ourselves out of this existence and pop back in somewhere else. Uh, they use it as a instantaneous form of communication, interplanetary communication. And I would imagine that some form of instantaneous communication will be the foundation of the desire to move and colonize other places that are far away, right? Um, because it's the, it's the connection with our fellow human beings that makes things like a four hour or a four hour, a four year journey or a 10 year journey, or like got to be frozen and stick out there. It's the communication with our fellow humans that probably emotionally holds us back from giving it our all. Right. So I would, I would imagine that that'll be a, uh, um, aside from energy, right. Figuring out the energy energy thing, but energy and communication, I think, are the big are the big leaps that we need to make before we start getting into space travel. Yeah, man. Well it's big topics. Would you would you be having this conversation <laughs> if you were 10 years ago and still in your in your job? I mean, do you do you feel as though like travel was taking you out of that uh, kind of fixed mindset? Um so I was an incredibly uber nerdy kid. Um, so when I was in high school, my friends and I used to read books about science and space, space travel. And we had those discussions like late at night, sitting in the backyard, looking up at the stars. I totally would have been, right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but anyways, probably not with the same level of clarity and like thoughts on, on, you know, like the freedom to travel and freedom to do some of those things. It would have more been like, that'd be cool if it happens in our lifetime. Um, mm -hmm. and it'd be cool to watch like the wealthy people go do that, but not, not with the same understanding that I have now, or it's like really, if you wanted anything that's available is, is open to, if you're willing to, you know, basically work your ass off for it. Yeah, sure. Wow, yeah. cool. Well, um, sorry to, so sorry to I, steal your last question. <laughs> go ahead. No, no problem. One last thing I do on every show, I call it the hero's challenge. Hero's challenge is pretty mm -hmm. simple. Um, do you have someone in your life, your business network that you think has a really cool entrepreneurial st story that you think we should bring on the show and have them tell their story? A, who is it? And B, why do you think they would be good to come on the show? <laughs> I like it. Probably Brandon, Brandon Pierce. Um, he's, uh, he's from the same, the same ilk as us. He's, uh, you know, he, he, he and his family have been traveling for 10 years and uh, his story is pretty amazing. Um, I'm sure he'll be able to inspire many of your, of your listeners um, to, to, challenge their, to challenge their thinking. And um, yeah, he's, um, I, I think he's probably going to be the uh, the guy. Awesome. Okay. So Brandon Pierce, I'll we'll definitely connect later and see if we can, uh, we can get him on the show. Um, yeah. Last thing is where can people find you if they either A, want to pick up on your sales training, if you're still offering that, or B, pick up your books um, or get a mm -hmm. hold of this homeschooling summit. Where can they find some of these things if they're, uh, if they're looking? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my uh, well, our family website is um, so my surname is Prince so it's Prince's off the grid that's what we um, dot weebly dot com I still use that free domain uh, it turned into you know it was just supposed to be a blog to keep friends and family uh, and I've just never changed it uh, there you can head and um, you can connect to us there via email find our Facebook page details there find my Twitter details there so it's all there on the blog um the book available on uh, on amazon but again it's all on the blog it's just a click link so probably best go to um princes off the grid dot weebly dot com i would say okay awesome and what about the homeschooling summit that you guys are putting together we, um, i'm not sure how much of my audience has homeschoolers but uh um i know i'm at least interested <laughs> yeah absolutely um that would be uh do you want me to provide you with a link and um well if you yeah, just go ahead and say it here on the on the thing Right, okay, homeschooling-summit.com. Oh, nice, a nice easy one, homeschooling-summit.com. And that's happening this June, you said? Yes, mid-June. Awesome, and look if, forward to, uh, to seeing that. And if you wanna check out the, um, the online uh, education thing, like uh, uh, hitting up freelance teachers with uh, freelance students, then that would be Galileo, that's G-A-L, I L E O Galileo XP.com. Cool. I'll put, um, put all those in the show notes here for people um, so they can yeah. check them out. 
And Daniel, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Um, it's good to have you on for the, for the interview. No problem at all. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Absolutely.